New Zealand's economy is absolutely crushing it at the moment, boasting the third highest growth rate among OECD countries. Compared to the last couple of decades, we're seeing some pretty solid economic growth, all while breaking records for low inflation. And guess what? That dreaded current account deficit that usually comes with New Zealand's economic expansions? Nowhere to be found. New Zealand's economy just did a little dance with a 2% growth in the last few months which totally blew economists' minds. This has the central bank feeling all tough and ready to fight inflation. The growth was fueled by a comeback in construction, services and tourism. With the 6.4% growth, they are leaving other developed economies in the dust as it bounces back from those pesky lockdowns that were meant to keep COVID-19 at bay. Let's go back in time and see how New Zealand did at a time when agriculture was the main sector. Their economy was based for a long time on a limited selection of agricultural goods, including dairy, meat and wool. From the 1850s until the 1970s, these goods were New Zealand's mainstay and most valued exports, supporting the country's economic growth. The dairy export quota represented over 35% of their overall exports from 1920 until the late 1930s, and in certain cases, nearly 45%. Believe it or not, for 70 years, New Zealand enjoyed one of the greatest levels of living in the world because of the strong demand for these main products, which was demonstrated by the wool boom of 1951. In the middle of the 20th century, more than 90% of New Zealand's exports came from pastoral farming products, with 65% of those exports going to Britain in the 1950s. It was also possible for them to levy heavy tariffs on imported commodities from other nations, since it had a stable market with fixed prices. Strict import regulations allowed domestic producers to create comparable goods domestically, increase the number of employment in New Zealand, and remain competitive with higher priced imports. This prosperity persisted until 1955, when Britain seized to guarantee New Zealand's export prices. From that point on, the free market determined what New Zealand was given, which caused the country's standard of living to decline in the 1950s and 1960s as the export sector was unable to keep up with the amount of imported products needed to satisfy the nation's rising consumption. Soon after, New Zealand started to look for other export markets and diversify its economy after losing unlimited access to its core market. The government of Norman Kirk placed more of an emphasis on growing New Zealand's trade, particularly with Southeast Asia. Then, Prime Minister Robert Muldoon came to power in 1975. In response to the 1979 energy crisis brought on by the Iranian Revolution that year, the Think Big economic policy was implemented. Weird name, no? Large-scale industrial facilities were built in New Zealand using the country's plentiful natural gas supply. In an effort to lessen New Zealand's reliance on oil imports, a new range of export goods, including gasoline, ammonia and methanol, were manufactured. Additionally, the North Island Main Trunk Railway was electrified. Other projects included the extension of the New Zealand Steel Plant and the construction of the Clyde Dam on the Clutha River, which was necessary to fulfil the increasing demand for energy. After winning the July 1984 election, the fourth Labour government shifted away from involvement in the economy and gave the market advantages in this matter. The term Rogernomics was used to refer to these changes. After Roger Douglas, the finance minister from 1984 to 1988, the modifications included tax neutrality, industry neutral competition regulation, and the Reserve Bank's independence from political decisions. New Zealand's economy went from being somewhat restricted and centralised to being among the most open in the OECD between 1984 and 1993. Not only that, government subsidies, including those for agriculture, were discontinued, import restrictions were relaxed, and interest rate, wage and price controls were lifted. Strict monetary policy and significant efforts to lower the public debt allowed inflation to decline from above 18% annually in 1987. In the 1980s and 1990s, government-owned business deregulation allowed for the reduction of some public debt and decreased the role of government in the economy. Seems like this Rogernomics is bearing fruit. If you think this is the end of the New Zealand boom, you're probably wrong because what happened in the next few years shows that they are still on the rise. But before we go into it, if you like this video so far, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel. Following the 1990 general election, the National Party was once again in control, and Ruth Richardson was appointed as Prime Minister Jim Bolger's Minister of Finance. And you know what? Richardson's first budget from 1991 tried to reduce state spending in an effort to solve ongoing fiscal deficits and borrowing. It was referred to as the mother of all budgets. This involved cuts to social assistance and unemployment benefits combined with the introduction of market rents for state-owned homes, 
which in certain cases tripled the rent for low-income individuals. In addition, a business-friendly regulatory framework was produced, and those who were able to benefit from it have profited. New Zealand scored 99.9% .9 in business freedom and 80% overall in economic freedom, according to a 2008 survey published in the Wall Street Journal. The survey also noted that the average time to create a firm in New Zealand is only 12 days, compared to an average of 43 days worldwide. But you know what's more amazing? Unemployment decreased steadily until the 1997 Asian financial crisis struck, which caused the rate to rise once more. The unemployment rate dropped to 5.3% in 2016, the lowest in seven years. New Zealand's GDP also grew by 3.5% a year on average between 2000 and 2007, mostly due to private consumption and a thriving housing market. Inflation during this time was only 2.6% annually on average, falling between the Reserve Bank's target range of 1% to 3%. You know what? Why don't we look at the bigger picture? New Zealand has had stunning economic expansion for a long time. And you must be wondering whether there are other factors behind their economic success. The first thing that should come to your mind is tourism. Actually, in New Zealand, the tourism sector employs around 10% of the labour force. Travellers from all over the world are drawn to the nation by its breathtaking, unspoiled scenery, exciting activities and eco-friendly reputation. As early as 1903, 5,233 foreign visitors per year were recorded for New Zealand. In 2019, approximately 3.9 million foreign visitors visited the country and the tourism industry generated $25 billion in revenue annually, or 10% of the GDP. The sector now offers more sophisticated cultural, adventurous and outdoor activities. More than 80% of new visitors in 1903 were Britons and Australians. Australians remained the largest single group in the early 21st century, but they are no longer as dominating. Instead, other source locations like China, Japan, South Korea and Europe became significant. Another factor that we shouldn't ignore is digital technology. According to estimates, the GDP of New Zealand benefited from the digital technology sector by $7 billion in 2021. Compared to the overall economy, which grew at a rate of 5.1% annually during the same period, the industry has risen at a rate of 10.4% annually since 2016. Also, natural resource dependence is minimal for exports of digital technology, which usually don't require physical transportation. This may present additional chances for long-term growth. The digital technology industry also helps other industries become more productive, which helps New Zealand's economy change to one that pays well and emits fewer greenhouse gases. It's important to mention that 3,750 individuals are employed in this sector. Most of them live and work in Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. With the growing popularity of remote work, the workforce of the future is probably going to be increasingly dispersed geographically. The digital technology sector is expected to increase and present chances for regional economic development because it depends less on physical resources than other industries. Digital technologies are a major enabler of economic revolution, as has been seen abroad. Building the knowledge base in New Zealand to develop solutions that benefit themselves as a nation and as global global exporters will become more crucial as economies become more digitally enabled. The industry for digital technology is a major contributor to the diversification of their economy and a catalyst for future economic growth. Another super important factor to consider is the stunning economic and public sector transformation. As we mentioned earlier, New Zealand undertook this wave of reforms in the 1980s and early 1990s. This transformation included groundbreaking reforms to its whole public sector management in response to mounting fiscal pressures, skyrocketing interest rates, and a declining dollar. The financial management reforms were a crucial element that aimed to enhance the performance of the public sector by setting efficient accountability frameworks. These included explicit output specifications, contractual agreements, and the division of government departments into smaller, more business-oriented agencies. Government departments in New Zealand could no longer function as the organisational cocoons that many of them once were, and the results were amazing. Through open accounting and lower public sector spending, the financial management reforms reduced pressure and abruptly changed the government's fiscal performance. As a result, New Zealand was able to emerge from a financial crisis in just four years. Now comes the fact that every investor and entrepreneur is looking for. The business and investment climate in New Zealand is so favourable. To further assist investors in their industry, the business environment is friendly and features a reliable system. New Zealand has also been recognised for providing excellent business support and came in second place on Forbes' list of the best countries for business in 2018. New Zealand was listed as the nation with the easiest business environment in the World Bank's 
ease of doing business index. This shows New Zealand's performed remarkably well because of a number of variables that work together to foster innovation, entrepreneurship and economic growth. The Kiwi strategy, which includes transparent governance and streamlined regulatory processes, is a model for other countries hoping to move up this important index. The simple business registration process in New Zealand is one of the main reasons for its high rating. Because of the government's dedication to reducing red tape and embracing technology, entrepreneurs can register a new firm online in a matter of hours. It's crazy how easy it is to start a business in this awesome country. This strategy not only encourages homegrown business owners to launch their projects, but also gives prospective international investors a pleasant impression. Despite so many factors and causes behind New Zealand's economic success, there are some challenges that we can't end this video without talking about. Let's focus on four main challenges. Challenge number one, skyrocketing housing prices. According to data, asking prices have increased in practically every district in New Zealand within the last 10 years. The median house price in New Zealand, according to the Real Estate Institute of New Zealand, was $359,000 and has been rising consistently for the last 10 years. Auckland's average house price hit $1.15 million as of June 2021 while the country's median house price soared to $820,000, a significant gain since 2011. New Zealand's economy growing, low borrowing rates, and more immigration were the main causes of this property market bubble. Property rises have shocked expectations by rising even in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. June 2020 and 2021 saw a 25% increase in the median property price in Auckland alone. New records are being broken by Auckland property values. Talking about houses, this takes us to the next challenge. Challenge number two, income and wealth inequality. The aspirations of numerous potential first-time house buyers to own a home are based upon the financial backing provided by their parents. But you should be careful about this because housing wealth is simply the tip of the iceberg. A major contributing factor to wealth inequality is housing. Housing contributes significantly to the wealth gap since it is frequently the main asset for families that own a home. Wealth and income also affect people's capacity to engage in the workforce. Similar to this, having money from their property is frequently used to launch small businesses, providing homeowners with a big edge. These businesses are also more resilient in the crucial early phases of their expansion, having a bigger cushion to withstand economic shocks thanks to their capacity to raise money against their homes. It's insane to believe that 70% of household wealth was held by just 20% of households. Challenge number three aging population and healthcare crisis. The rate at which New Zealanders are aging is crazy, and as they do, they will require more assistance from the healthcare system. One million of New Zealand's population will be over 65 in just six years, and shortly after that, 25% of the country's total population will be over 65. The healthcare system, which is barely able to meet the current demand, has to meet future demands that will be much higher due to the growing population of elderly people who will need a larger share of the healthcare budget. If they currently feel that there is a burden on their health systems, wait another 15 to 20 years and see what happens when roughly one in four New Zealanders reaches the age of 65. And finally, challenge number four, rising unemployment rate. From 3.4% in December 2022, the unemployment rate increased by 0.6% points during the course of the year. The underutilization rate, which measures excess labour capacity more broadly than just unemployment, was 10.7% in the quarter ending in December 2023. This is in contrast to 10.4% in the prior quarter and 9.3% in the quarter ending in December 2022. What then is the reason for this recent increase in unemployment? One major contributing element is the large labour inflow, which is fueled by a net gain of about 130,000 immigrants. Although this increase in the labour force may appear encouraging at first glance, it may not be sufficient to meet the skill shortages. Amidst the surplus of workers available, industries including construction, engineering and healthcare still struggle to locate qualified people. It's interesting to note that the Reserve Bank has a different perspective on growing unemployment than other people do. They understand that in order to control inflation, a tighter labour market is necessary. In this situation, a slight increase in unemployment can be a required corrective action to lessen the strain caused by the continued increase in the cost of living. Given the current challenges, it's weird to have a very optimistic outlook on New Zealand's economic future in the medium term. Over the last few decades, New Zealand has shown some positive economic achievements, but there have also been instances where crucial issues were overlooked and long-term strategies were not adequately developed. The emergence of imbalances in the economy serves as a cautionary signal that indicates the economic situation may not be as robust as previously thought. Thanks for watching till the end. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons to receive more content. See you in the next video.